Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for June 2024. I'm Hayley and this month we will be looking out for Noctilucent Clouds, the Improving Planets, the Plato Crater, the Constellation of Boötes and the Globular Cluster M3. Let's begin by taking a look at Noctilucent Clouds or Night Shining Clouds. They are high altitude ice clouds formed in the mesosphere and they can produce amazing blue or silvery glowing displays between May and early August. So now is the perfect time to start going out and looking for them. During the period just after sunset or before sunrise, sunlight can reflect off the ice sheets in the clouds which is what causes them to glow. And the best place to look is to either go low above the northwestern horizon around 90 minutes after sunset or above the northeastern horizon around 90 minutes before sunrise. So you can see here that on the 1st of June, um, sunset's around 10 past 9. So I'm looking towards my northwestern horizon at about 20 to 11. If you're struggling to know which direction is northwest where you are, then you can look out for the bright star Capella. So this will be one of the first stars to pop out in this uh, region of the sky. We have the north star over here as well, Polaris, but in the period just after sunset when the sky isn't very dark, you're probably not going to be able to spot Polaris because it's not very bright. So Capella is a much better marker star. Um, but as long as you're looking roughly in this direction, it doesn't matter if you're looking exactly to the northwest. Um, they make wonderful photographs, so you might like to take your camera with you um, or you can try using your smartphone if it has a night mode on it. Um, I know lots of people have been successful uh, capturing the aurora lately um, with smartphones. Noctilucent clouds are another thing that um, can be picked up really well on smartphone cameras. They're not very predictable, so the best way to catch them is to just go out regularly between now and the beginning of August, um, either after sunset or before sunrise, whichever you prefer, and see if you can spot any. Um, towards the end of the month, sunset will be around 20 past nine, so um, you, you might want to go out a little bit later. And of course, depending on where you are in the country, your sunset and sunrise times will vary. Um, but you don't need to be too specific with that either, as long as you start an hour to an hour and a half after sunset or before sunrise, then you're in with a good chance of spotting noctilucent clouds. Let's move on to the planets now. Most of the planets are still not well placed for observing this month. They all lie close to the sun. The situation will improve dramatically over the coming months though. So we do have lots of planetary action to look forward to later in the year. In the meantime, the best time to observe all of the planets in June is towards the end of the month. I don't think I would bother trying at the beginning of the month. Um, by the end of the month, Mercury and Venus will be emerging as evening planets and Mars, Jupiter and Saturn will remain as improving morning planets. Uranus and Neptune are also morning planets, but they are not well placed for observing at the moment. So I wouldn't try um, observing those. So if we take a look at Mercury, first of all, so I'm going to go to towards the end of the month, so the 28th and I'm going to go 9.45, so not very long after sunset at all, where I am. So about half, maybe half an hour after sunset. So I'm looking towards the western horizon. You can see the glow from the setting sun. And here is Mercury. So very low to the horizon just after sunset, be really, really difficult to spot. And Venus is down here somewhere. So I, don't, I really don't think you're going to be able to spot Venus until um, we get out of June and into July. Um, and if we watch Mercury over the time after sunset, it is going to set around 10 o'clock bearing in mind that sunset isn't going to be until around 20 past nine. So very, very difficult to spot um, Mercury or Venus at the moment. It's always worth saying as well that if you are observing near sunset or sunrise, be very wary of the rising or the setting sun. Make sure that you don't observe until the sun is below the horizon and be very careful if you're sweeping around with a pair of binoculars or a telescope to make sure that you don't accidentally get the sun. If we go into the morning now and take a look at the morning planets, so I'm, I'm going to swing around towards the eastern part of the sky, or south, southeastern part of the sky, and I'm going to take us through the night. 
and we can see Saturn has risen, so around one o'clock-ish, you get Saturn first. Um, on this night, the 29th of June, we've got a nice uh, crescent moon as well, rising after Saturn, or half moon, actually, rising after Saturn. And if we keep going, we can see Mars pops out next, so around two o'clock in the morning we've got Mars, and then finally followed by Jupiter, and you can see that the sky is starting to brighten now. So Jupiter is still quite a tricky customer in June, um, but Saturn and Mars are quite um, well-placed or as well-placed as any planets are at the moment for observing. You can have a try at any of these objects with a small telescope if you wish to. So if we take a look at Saturn, do a telescopic view of Saturn, then um, you might you should certainly be able to make out the disk of Saturn with a small telescope. You should be able to make out Saturn's largest moon, Titan. The rings are quite edge on at the moment, so you won't get as good a view of the rings as you do at other times, but you can see if you can spot Saturn's rings as well. If we take a look at Mars, so with the naked eye or the pair of binoculars, you're looking out for a, a reddish something that looks like a reddish star but is in fact a planet. And if you go to a telescopic view, really the thing that you're wanting to try and spot with your telescope is that Mars actually does show a disk and is a planet. Um, the apparent size of Mars at the moment is quite small, um, coupled with the fact that it's the summer, so the sky doesn't get properly dark and Mars is still fairly low to the horizon. You will struggle to make out any surface details, I think, um, on Mars at the moment, but certainly you should be able to discern that it has a disk. And then Jupiter, let's see. Okay, have a look at Jupiter. Again, it'd be tricky to see detail because we're now in quite a bright sky, um, but you should still be able to make out the four Galilean moons and the um, north and south equatorial cloud belts you'll probably still be able to see with a reasonable size telescope as well. A few interesting pairings to look out for throughout the month. Um, the first is a meeting of Mars and the Moon on the morning of the 3rd of June. So I'm going to go back in time to the uh, 3rd of the month. And here we are. So um, we're about 3 o'clock in the morning at the moment. So let's just go back a bit. So Mars rising at about three o'clock along with the moon. So them rising together, lovely crescent moon. And you'll get a little bit of time before the sun starts to rise. So three o'clock is about the best time to go out and see if you can catch those two together. Then the very next day, if we go to the fourth, there is a very tricky conjunction of Jupiter and Mercury. And they rise only 30 minutes before the sun. So if we keep going, keep going, here comes Jupiter, still marked from earlier on, which is quite handy, and there's Mercury. So Jupiter and Mercury, if we go back again, you want the clearest possible horizon you can, you don't want buildings and trees and things in the way. So around quarter past four, Jupiter and Mercury together. Um, and they, their closest approach actually occurs in daylight. Um, you should be able to get them in binoculars if you've got a nice flat east, northeastern horizon, but take very great care if you are using binoculars just before the sun rises. Um, and you can see they fit very nicely into a 10 by 50 binocular view over here. Sunrise on the 4th of June here in Leicester is at 4.45, so you can see that here we're only about 10 minutes away from sunrise, so great care needed for that one. And then on the 5th, so the next day again, um, you've got the moon and Jupiter visible together in the morning, so a really thin crescent moon over here and Jupiter down here. And then if we... Um, move to the 27th and the 28th then it is Saturn's turn to receive a visit from the moon and we can 
go into a nice darker part of the night um, for this one, which is a bit of a relief, isn't it? Um, so here we go. We've got the gibbous moon and Saturn. So that's the 27th and the 28th. Um, so they will be a, a nice pairing to look out for when you're not worrying about the sun um, about to rise. Let's stay with the moon. Uh, this month's new moon occurs on the 6th of June and the full moon is in the early hours of the 22nd of June, about one o'clock in the morning. So I'm just going to go to one o'clock in the morning on the 22nd. And the June full moon is known as the strawberry moon. Um, or most often known as the strawberry moon, which is a name that originated with Native American tribes who used it to signal the beginning of strawberry harvesting season in North America. And our last moon watch target um, was the area around the Mare Imbrium or Sea of Showers. So that's this area here. So if you remember back to a couple of months ago, we were talking about um, the Mare Imbrium and the, uh, or the Sea of Showers and the Bay of Rainbows over here. So I'd like to move um, to the northeastern shore of the Sea of Showers to this crater here, this dark crater, which is named Plato. And dark craters are interesting because they look like tiny seas um, and are usually older than their brighter counterparts. They're filled with dark lava that solidified into a smooth layer, which is often hit with further impacts, resulting in little craterlets that sort of pit the surface of these um, dark craters. And Plato is a really good example of that. Uh, it's about 61 miles wide, and you can see it with a pair of binoculars. So if you, you've got a pair of binoculars, Plato is a great target to see if you can find. Um, and if you have a look with a small telescope and wait until um, the crater is near the terminator... Uh, then you may be able to spot the little craterlets that are disrupting the, the otherwise nice smooth floor of the um, Crato Plato, uh, the Plato crater. And if we just go through the days following uh, full moon, then you can see the Terminator approaching um, the Plato crater. And we're getting a bit close to the horizon now. So I'm just going to take us a bit higher um, so that it doesn't look distorted by the horizon so here we are still the, the Plato crater so uh, we're on the 29th of June now and you can see the the Terminator approaching and we go to the 30th and the, the Terminator is pretty much on the the Plato crater so it's definitely worth if you have um, particularly if you have a telescope and you want to explore this region um, always having a look when um, the, your region of interest is near the Terminator is a good idea. Saying goodbye to the moon now, we go on to our constellation of the month, which is Boötes. And we've been exploring some of the spring constellations over the last few months, um, and I'd like to continue that um, by looking at Boötes, the herdsman. Um, and in Greek mythology... Boötes represents Arcas, who was cast into the sky along with his mother, um, who is the great bear of Ursa Major or um, Callisto. So they were cast into the sky together um, by a great whirlwind. And Boötes contains one of the brightest stars in the night sky with um, Arcturus. And you can use the familiar shape of the, the Big Dipper or the plough um, to find Arcturus by following the arc of the handle of the plough, follow the arc to Arcturus. Um, and you'll know that you've got it because it's bright and it's uh, it's got an orangey colour to it and it's actually a red giant star in the final stages of its life. Um, it's run out of hydrogen fuel to fuse into helium and has swelled to this enormous size and it will eventually lose its outer layers, leaving behind a tiny white dwarf star and a planetary nebula, um, which is the same fate that we can expect our sun for our sun in about 5 billion years' time. That leads me nicely into our deep sky target for this month, which is the globular cluster M3. 
And I'm cheating slightly because I normally like to choose a deep sky object that resides in the constellation that we have chosen for the month. Um, but M3 actually technically is in the constellation of Canis Venatici, which is this little constellation over here um, with these two not very um, bright stars. But actually, Arcturus is a really good pointer for the globular cluster M3, and it's actually a little bit closer to Arcturus than it is to these as well. Um, so if we just zoom into the area between these, um, this uh, Canis Venatici and uh, the Arcturus, and look for a fuzzy blob. And there it is. So uh, the globular cluster M3. And globular clusters are tightly packed concentrations of ancient stars held together by gravity and they're thought to be some of the oldest objects in the universe which is one of the many things that makes them interesting. M3 is thought to contain over half a million stars and more variable stars than any other known cluster um, so the, the brightness of the lots of the stars in this cluster um, varies over time. Um, it has a magnitude of 6.3 um, which is just outside of naked eye visibility, um, but it should be easy with a pair of binoculars. So if you um, sweep that area of sky with your binoculars, you should be able to pick it out as a, it will look like a slightly fuzzy star in a pair of binoculars. You're not going to be able to make out lots and lots of individu individual stars like this. Um, it will look much more impressive in a telescope, and the larger the telescope, the better. And um, Astronomers are always wanting the larger and larger telescopes and, and one place where that is very, very helpful is with globular clusters so that you can resolve as many of the stars out of the sort of haziness um in the, the centre of the globular cluster as possible. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for June. I wish you clear skies for all of your observing and good luck with your hunting for Noctilucent clouds this month.